Works. All right. Cool. Um, so we had the question um, about all the, the HPC runtime, or about it specifically about singularity, if it can be used as Kubernetes runtime. And I think I would like to open this up to all of you. Like, um, what is the status about around um, runtime, HPC runtimes being used as, I think it's then a cry runtime? Maybe who wants to start? Greg or Luca? Maybe Greg, can you give us a picture or is Ian on as well? Um, with a picture about the uh, singularity being used as Kubernetes runtime. I could take a first stab at it and, and try. Uh, Ian on uh, the team also who's here can jump in if I miss anything. But in general, uh, to run a container runtime within uh, Kubernetes, you need to have a hook via the CRI interface. Uh, if you have an OCI compatible runtime, you can do that via the existing CRIO uh, interface. If not, your container runtime needs to have a CRI interface into Kubernetes. We have created one uh, for Singularity, so that does exist and that's available in a GitHub that we can post here shortly. Could I ask kind of a follow-up question on that? I was curious if there's been sort of what's been the level of adoption there and what kind of use cases you've seen uh, with people running in that mode. So if you're, if you're, hi Shane, by the way. So if you're asking on the Singularity CRI side, um, it's open source, so I don't know exactly who's using it, and I'm still surprised every time I hear somebody uh, using it because we put it out there as a proof of concept. It was a funded proof of concept um, by US Federal. Uh, but with that being said, yeah, it's uh, one of the things that that we found from people that have tested it is that, and and I, you know, people can kick me if you want, but uh, one of the things that people have said to us is that Kubernetes is is not a great batch scheduler and is not you know, very good at, um, everybody has locked up for me. So hopefully you guys can still see and hear me. Okay. Uh, none of, or unless you guys are all standing really, really still anyway. Uh, yeah, you're still coming through. <laughs> okay. Okay. Awesome. So basically, um, now I lost my train of thought. So basically, <laughs> Um, yeah, there, we, we don't know exactly what people are using it. People have told us that there is not a huge amount of um, uh, uptake in terms of using Kubernetes for batch style workloads. There's a lot of interest. People are talking about it a lot, but we had just haven't seen people actually um, be able to, to build an environment and put that into production and make really good, efficient use of it um, in general. Now, I'm sure there are people doing it and I'd love to hear about it. That's just the feedback that we've gotten so far. But let's Thanks. let's focus on the runtime there. But um, and I think I mean most of the the Kubernetes installments in the cloud, at least, they only have one runtime, right? And and someone points that out, I think, at the in the Slack channel. Um, maybe we need to do a better job explaining to those vendors what other runtimes are out there and what they can can do for that, right? So, but yeah. That's at least like it's on all of us, I guess. But yeah, um, maybe uh, Luca, um, Lucas, can you use Cyrus as a runtime for Kubernetes? Do you have a CRI shim? No, no, Cyrus does not include the the CRI uh, interface that you need to interact with. Um, better said, to make the runtime available from from Kubernetes. The focus is is pure HPC, and as Greg was saying, uh, we also run into the the same gap uh, regarding Kubernetes and scheduling batch jobs. Uh, for the time being, we are focusing on, on, on filling that gap, on having the containers perform as, as better as possible in a batch style configuration. Yeah, makes sense. Take Valentin, then it's your partner term. Partner in Kubernetes, you mean? Yeah, or uh, maybe. Well, um, this is this is not really what what Partman 
Potman is the design for somehow it would be in-house competition because we're also developing a container engine or runtime specifically for Kubernetes, which is called Cryo, C-R-I-O, which does really nothing but to serve the Kubernetes CI and the, basically the kubelet. Both use the same the same libraries. So images you pull with Cryo or Podman, you can share them. They use the same storage libraries. So if you want to run Kubernetes, um, we have Cryo for that. Although technically with Podman v2, as it speaks the Docker API, you could use the Kubernetes Docker shim and run Podman, but I, I believe none of, none of us has tested that yet. Um, because it would be in-house in -house competition. So Podman's only focus is really single node and to do this as well as possible and leave uh, everything else to Cryo and the Kubernetes folks. But for Podman, it's the other way around somehow, right? You, you, you support running pods locally with Podman, right? That's right. Um, we implemented the, the concept of, of pods. That's also where Podman got the name from, Pod Manager. Um, and this opens up a whole new or a couple of new use cases and makes running um, applications and services easier. For instance, if uh, it allows for an easier communication across containers because um, you can just ping local host and then the port because the containers that run within a pod, they share certain namespaces. And most importantly, I believe, is the network namespace, but also the, the IPC and the PID namespace. So you see processes running inside the pod as well. But if you want to run Kubernetes deployments and you don't have a cluster at hand, which I believe many developers run into this problem, um, then Podman can help there too. So we added a command, which is called Podman play cube which you throw a Kubernetes YAML at. So the input is a Kubernetes YAML file you would usually usually use with kubectl. And Podman will create a pod or a set of pods and containers based on the input file. So you can run these things locally. So we somehow try to make with Podman a bridge to Kubernetes and make this as easy as possible, at least as easy as we think it could be. Um, because arguably running running a small pod in a container is easier than setting up a, an entire Kubernetes cluster on a single developer machine. That's most certainly true, yeah. Okay, any other thoughts on Kubernetes and runtime interaction? Do I, I Thinking about it, isn't it something that we should also push as said, like for machine learning, a lot of Kubernetes is used, right? And they like they in the non-HPC world, they do it in the, uh, without HPC runtimes. They just use normal Docker or container D runtimes or whatever is out there. So it's something maybe that we should make our voice heard. So that uh, may be a conversation better for the orchestrate segment, but I mean, I'm seeing people using Kubernetes for more of the inferencing side than the training side. That's of course true as well. Yeah. All right, and I violate my own rule of not talking about orchestration too much. Okay, so uh, <laughs> okay, so let's move on to um, OCI hooks, and or OCI hooks, and I would say the alternatives there are right. I mean, we we used to package the drivers into the container file system, that kind of didn't work well. Then we started using hooks or using uh, NVIDIA runtime to. Uh, put the 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 host driver into the container and um, and now with OCI hooks it seems to become a standard of working around uh, working around this. I think it, as an idealist I would like to have everything in the container and then pick the right container for the right host. But that's of course something that we cannot do as of today. But uh, hopefully the future. But until we get there, that I get my wish, um, we need to do something right. And is OCI hooks the right way do what do you guys think are you guys all implement oci hooks someone in there somewhere in the future or i mean cyrus already does potman 
like maybe maybe Vanadin, what, what about Podman and OCI hooks? Um, Podman supports OCI hooks um, because it's part of the runtime specification and Podman aims to be and is 100% compatible with the image spec and the runtime spec. So um, Portman allows for, for running these hooks. And we've been, we've been using them in the community um, quite a lot in the past. One big hook was the systemd hook that we used to make systemd run in, inside a container because systemd um, needs certain mounts to be, um, or yeah, certain devices and mounts to be mounted in a specific way. Um, it's it's quite picky about this. We use this for Docker um, in Fedora and also in, in, in RHEL. Now Podman supports mount or detects when a container when basically the the init binary is system D and it will auto mount everything. So we don't need to do this anymore. And also I hook we've been recently working on last year um, in the context of a Google Summer of Code project. We were fortunate enough to get a very brilliant student who also liked to, to work hard and uh, code a lot. Um, we developed an OCI hook to trace syscalls within a container and based on the set of syscalls, generate a custom seccomp um, profile for it. So this was, I, I know I should use trust, but this was really a security feature. <laughs> so this was again in the context of container security. And um, this is, we don't do this for all containers, but you gotta specify a specific annotation to execute the, the hook. So this is a way we've been discussing this in the advisory council uh, also uh, with uh, Lucas a lot and uh, the, the Cyrus folks in general and wider community, how we can find conven conventions um, among these hooks, because if a certain hook is being executed uh, or not is up to the hook and up to the container engine, which is um, executing run C or C run or whatever container on them we want. Um, so I guess there's there's still some some work to do for for us in the wider community to find conventions that we want to use, um, how to approach it, and share the the lessons learned, best practices. So far for us, using annotations has uh, worked pretty pretty well because. This allows us for turning a hook on and off and also for specifying arguments. For instance, we want um, the profile to be generated and written to a specific path. So this is something we also pass via the annotation. Or for instance, we already have a second profile and just want to add um, the syscalls that have been um, traced in the last run. Basically, we need an input and an output profile. All these, all these things can be passed down. Okay, and I mean, maybe someone else before I, I ask my next uh, scintillating question. On the singularity side, we have a notion of plugins, which is obviously not an OCI hook, um, but we do have, uh, so we have various features, including like NVIDIA driver injection and whatnot, that we are leveraging those those plugins for. Um, we have an API for doing that in Go. Um, but with that being said, uh, we also have an OCI subcommand group within Singularity to give full, C full OCI uh, support. And I do believe that that has um, OCI plugin support as well. And how do we deal with, like, when I schedule something, do I just expect that the OCI hook is in the right version, that everything works as I intended it to work? Like, we, we have this host dependency now, right? I mean, we always had this, but, and we make it easier with OCI hooks. Okay, I agree on that one. But is it, 
what do you guys how many pitfalls do we need to walk through until we we come to a, an oci hook dreamland or do i get my wish first and we put everything in the container again you know that's really where i hope to be is that eventually we can stop doing weird tricks for instance to enable mpi and we can actually use you know build it build the mpi that you need to run um you know, in your container from scratch. And a lot of that depends on the vendors and pressure that we put uh, or as the community on vendors. If if you're, if you have to do these weird hooks or manage, you know, some of the glibc issues that Lucas talked about, I think you should be having a conversation with your supercomputing vendor right now, if you're not already, about how we could do better at this. Because there's going to be some limitations always. I don't see them disappearing entirely, but I think we could do a better job at, at, at getting these correct and having maybe different base images that have similar or same functionality that we can build from that have the right tools, base images provided by our supercomputing vendors, that sort of thing. So. I just had to come off mute to suck in that. That is, it, it's in my mind, it is the biggest issue and biggest hurdle to get over with containerized computing on, on supercomputing. Because uh, again, whether you're dealing with MPI, whether you're dealing with InfiniBand, whether you're dealing with NVIDIA, whether you're dealing with old containers, you have to deal with glibc issues, um, which scares me. I'm glad you guys implemented something because that sort of stuff really scares me. Um, you know, messing with glibc on a system just should never happen. Um, so if you guys have done it, I mean, that's fantastic. Uh, so the users don't have to do it, but at the same token, uh, it would be just, it would be so much cleaner and so much better if we didn't have to deal with the tightly coupled interfaces down to the host kernel um, and whatnot. Anyway. Yeah, I think that the problem here is that, of course, like Andrew, Luca, you, you have like big sites, but um, customers or users of smaller sites that they only have like a couple of nodes, they are not going to confront HPE and say, like, we need this hook, we need this hook. I mean, they don't have the leverage, right? So either we come up with something that works for everyone, or, I mean, just saying, I mean, I, I, it's, I think it's hard. Like, we need this intermediate step. I guess it's it's something that we need for the foreseeable future. But eventually, I agree totally, like, and eventually we come to a better place, but um, maybe not tomorrow. Shane, what is your take? Yeah. Yeah, I'll just, just a remark. I put it in the chat, but I, you know, we Andrew and I even had a paper uh, last year at Canopy HPC, sort of around some of these things. I think that the challenge is we need better abstractions for many of these um, inter interfaces than we have today, and so I, you know, that takes a lot of I think care and thought to design those. But that's something that has to be done in collaboration, both with the vendors, but I think even the broader community. It's you know, it's a tough nut. Yeah, to add on that, I, you know, HPC does have a history of defining community interfaces and potentially we've lost some of that over the past five, 10 years or so. And we should start to start to look at get back, getting back to it. Um, it's fine if there's, there needs to be a tight interface between the kernel and, um, and say your user space container, but we should know what that is. We should know what that API looks like. We can know when we when we break ABI compatibility, for instance, those those are things that I really think we should do a better job of fleshing out. And they're hard. And it does take a lot of work and integration with, you know, the entire vendor community. So, but yeah. We had a similar, similar um, thought or issue with the um, OCI hook that I was talking about before. So, we somehow solved the problem of generating custom profiles based on a workload for a given container, but we somehow wanted to get that to the users. And there you have the similar problem. If you want to use the second profile, um, it must be in one way or another installed or distributed to each and every machine. And um, the approach we are doing now or following now is to embed the second profile into a container image. And if it's specified also via an annotation, which are also supported in the image spec, not only in the runtime spec, if there is a certain um, annotation in the 
image config, then we will apply this second um, profile, but only if it's stricter than the default one, because we want to tighten security and not open up uh, up the door. Um, so I believe if there are certain if there are certain metadata or attributes which do not consume a lot of memory, those things could be embedded in the container image. Um, yeah. I believe in an entire binary such as an OCI hook may be too big. So um, I guess this will always, uh, or in those cases, be uh, another dependency on the host. But small enough data and especially metadata can, can be embedded in the OCI spec. And if the problem can be generalized sufficiently enough, it has a good chance of getting into the specification. Yeah, certainly. That's that similar to, I think, I don't know if it's exactly the same, but in the, that same paper, what one idea that Andrew and I discussed was annotating images with um, saying what their requirements were from like a hardware execution standpoint. I think what's, what's missing there is you need some standards about this is the way we're going to generate and put these labels in so that the runtime knows where to look for it. And, and respond. But the idea would be like, I, you know, this image is designed for this version of GPU or this version of MPI runtime. And at least you could use that information to do some uh, some mappings or something like that. It's still, I think, a it's, it's not as good as having um, better abstractions that you could just build an image and it would always do a good job, but it, it might still be necessary to some degree. I've just put a link to the paper that Shane's referring in the chat or in the Slack channel, if it wasn't there already. Yeah, and I, I, but I think like the question is, and I'm I'm violating my own rule again, like talking about distribution for a sec. But um, the thing is, like, or is it, the question is, do who do needs to decide what needs to be executed on the host, right? If we would distribute images that are like tailored for a specific instance, for a specific node, for a specific cluster, then we don't need this runtime um, decision that needs to be made on the, on the, at the runtime, right? If, if we could create images beforehand, then we know we have this five hosts. Okay, for, for the internet, that's of course almost impossible to pre-build pre all the hosts that are all the permutations that we have, but for like HPC centers with only a sub certain set of instances or for cloud vendors, that we also don't have uh, like gazillions of different permutations. We could say at a distribution time, we, we serve images that have the exact things that are necessary for the, uh, the instance to run, right? But of course, that doesn't allow like uh, sec comp rules to be, to be in place there, yeah, uh, okay. Cool, but that's for, for bigger centers. Like, um, Burak, what, what do you think for, for the small vendors or for the small, um, small folks, for smaller customers? Do they, I think OCI hooks are a good way of, of having one specification of dealing with things while we are figuring out to do a better job in maybe generalizing this, right? What do you think? Yeah, um, I, I see a lot of the um, enterprises going towards either um, managed Kubernetes solutions or managed uh, container solutions in the public cloud or uh, looking at their Linux vendors to make something available for them rather than um, following the path of the academic community where uh, folks are much, much more hands-on. I mean, Lucas, Greg, Andrew, you know, these guys would just jump in and start coding if they don't find something that's suitable for them. That's not what you find in industry. Um, so there's a trickle down effect and the conversations that are in this room are very useful for enterprises, but uh, there's a lag time of a, um, of a year or two before it shows up in enterprise. You know, I will quickly capitalize on that point, if you don't mind, and say that if we can do this right for HPC, we should solve a lot of these problems, say with GPUs and future tensor accelerators that matter a lot to the ML, AI, deep learning community. So I think there's an opportunity for leadership here that we could take advantage of, just on that point. 
And yeah. Andrew, you said this pretty well. I believe the HPC community always had this leadership in terms of being on the cutting edge. It's actually part of the definition of high performance and supercomputing that we would be on the bleeding edge of things. That's how we define a supercomputer. Um, so it does make sense that some of these capabilities are first uh, incubated in this environment, discussed, and then it flows into enterprise. Um, I saw in the Slack channel whether um, enterprises will access this through the cloud. So th that's an interesting thought. So maybe a lot of the innovation happens right here with the folks um, that are on this call today. Um, but then when it comes to um, enterprises putting their hands on it, cloud may be that good incubation ground um, for them to get access to these new technologies. It may then move on premise um, with their hardware and software vendors over time. So to, to answer your question real quick, uh, Christian, so I don't think the enterprises are anywhere near the, the level of discussion we're having here with OCI hooks and, and such. But this serves as well as a motivation speech for HPC again, right? We were in the defenses the last couple of years, I think maybe decade. Like they, they like the big vendors, the big uh, Facebooks and Googles, they took the crown of being the bleeding edge, or at least the perception maybe was that way. And now we can really shine and, and show, okay, guys, now you need us again. It's the same like uh, the, the GPU guys, they said we don't need InfiniBand. And now they, they had this DX2 uh, with like gazillions of InfiniBand cards. And then they were crawling back and say, okay, yeah, now we need InfiniBand again. So maybe... In container and we can do the same like show that we have experience show that we can optimize so that we can like put performance in containers and then shaboom we are coming back out of the gate swinging right. i'm gonna have to pay off christian with, for this plug but uh, uh maybe a good belgian beer or something like that <laughs> but with that being said i mean this is something that we've seen a lot of as we're talking to various uh, organizations which is uh they're, they're looking to to glean insight from HPC communities uh, in terms of the capabilities that we've been able to do for quite some time. But how we build systems is extraordinarily legacy at this point. It is so legacy that most enterprises want to have nothing to do with HPC. Uh, so, I mean, and here's where the plug comes in. So my the organization that we're working through right now, um, I've been able to get funded to, to really help drive a lot of this initiative around the next generation of high performance computing and modernization of HPC. So this is something that I'm extraordinarily interested in, would love to talk more about it, but it's probably not best within the segment, but sorry, Christian, beer's coming. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Like beer to me. I'm German. I like beer. It's a stereotype I, I, I can I deal with. Um, Notice I put the Belgian in there. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of vocal on the, on the Slack channel. So yeah, that's, that's good. Uh, uh, yeah, no. Um, and then Kenneth mentioned like that HPC is bleeding edge with regards to hardware, but not software in his experience. I think that's maybe, can we agree on that one? That maybe we iterate not that fast or as fast as, as others by the nature of HPC, I think that's, but we are with, with HPC CM and we will talk about this in the next, like uh, in the next segment, but um, I think we are, we are catching up, right? So yeah, nodding, nodding is good. Okay, um, OCI Hawks, we maybe look at from, from your perspective, you, you, I think you have the, the longest experience with OCI hooks, if I'm not mistaken, in the, the panelists. Do you think that um, we nailed it now, or is there something that's missing? Like, what is the next hook you are going to implement? Well, I'm, I mean, you all know I'm certainly biased on this topic, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I've been hammering with OCI hooks for I don't know how long. So um, I don't think we nailed it. There's a uh, quite a long way to go. It's one of the options. I do feel that we made great progress uh, by introducing OCI hooks, and we are getting better at the uh, portability of performance, if you wish. Not only portability of software stacks, but also performance. There are several, let's say, uh, glitches still, you know, in this uh, 
or gray points in this area. Uh, MPI is one of those. Uh, hardware vendors and another one. Um, ideally, and, and I think it was mentioned in one of the slides uh, of Saros, uh, ideally, uh, OCI hooks should be used for a separation of concerns, right? For vendors to focus on covering what's specific to their hardware or specific to their drivers. And they should let us take care of bringing the users to the hardware that, that they deliver to us, right? Now, of course, th this is, you know, in PowerPoint, it looks good. In practice, we still have to get a little bit better, right? In that sense. So it's a, if you wish, it's a, it's a public call to all vendors since this is being streamed on live. A public call to all vendors, you know, to jump on, code OC, an OCI hook for your, uh, for your hardware, for your driver, and help us bring performance to a wider, to a wider range of, uh, of containers. That at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's a win-win it's a combination, not only for infrastructure service providers, but also for vendors, because they will have uh, uh, more, more users on their hardware. And do we need to, like, can we stop at like centers and HPC vendors or do we need to reach out? I was about to say beat up, but reach out to ISVs as well. Like is this, do we need OCI hooks for certain software as well? Like not sure if that's a valid thing, but do we just? Well, Valentin mentioned a, a software specific example earlier, right? I mean, the, the security aspect being taken care of by an OCI hook. I, I think that's a valid use case. That's a valid use case. And in certain environments, because the OCI hook runs uh, at a different level than the user code, it's, uh, it's certainly an interesting op opportunity for bringing security and other features uh, to, the, to the ecosystem, let's say. Right. It's so the decision to 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 implement the syscall tracing in a hook instead of just getting it merged into Podman was that we really wanted other container engines to use it too. So um, as as long as the engine sets the annotation, Docker can use it, ContainerD can use it, Cryo can use it, Soros can use it, Singularity can use it. Anybody who supports um, the runtime spec can use it so um, our intention was to in increase the audience rather than than reducing it in this specific case so as a vendor sometimes even as a portman maintainer um, uh, i really objected the idea of getting getting this into the into Portman because we wanted to make it available for everybody and for people also to collaborate on it I, I think security is important, but I almost wonder how much of that should just be built into the kernel, right? Like using BPF, for instance, outside of a container could be an interesting approach. Um, the hook actually uses BPF. Or... <laughs> okay, good. All right, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> we are, I, I think we I'm reading using... what you're talking about then. Cool. We're using BPF because um... Now, even S-Trace is using now BPF. So with uh, newer versions of S-Trace, we could have just used S-Trace. Um, but BPF is just so much uh, so much faster and advanced. And in, in my opinion, maybe I guess we, I believe we still have around 30 minutes. Um, I believe things like BPF um, will be, will be, let's say the, the new playground of container container engines. Because at least uh, I somehow feel at least Potman um, is ma maturing now. So we, we stabilize everything we have now. At least that's my prediction. I haven't talked to, to a PM. So um, I'm talking as a community member and not as a Red Hat employee at the moment. Um, I, I believe we will stabilize what we have now for sure listen to what the users and customers want but some of my guts tell me that the new playground where we will play will making what we have now 
um, more mature, especially when it comes to security. There's uh, great stuff coming from the Kuber Kubernetes community, actually, with especially in the security domain with respect to uh, intrusion detection, um, reducing the attack surface. So there are tools, um, I, I believe Inspector Gadget from Kinfolk does it. Kinfolk is a, is a company uh, based in Berlin and they do a lot of great stuff in the, in the Kubernetes ecosystem. And one of their open source tools is called Inspector Gadget. Um, I don't know much about Kubernetes. I'm one level below, but as far as I know, they are able to, at runtime, to disable syscalls of a container. So based on profiles and they will trace it via EBP, eBPF, they will know certain syscalls that are needed and some that are just not needed based on a profile. Uh, so they can disable it at runtime live. So, I mean, all these things uh, sound uh, crazy, but they're amazing because obviously they seem to work. And can also, I I can I, I interrupt you like for a sec? I oh mean, yeah, please. I think a lot of people maybe on the call know what eBPF is, but can you give us the gist of eBPF? I think that would be worthwhile just spending a minute on. Sure. Um, so eBPF is. Uh, an abbreviation for um, the extended Berkeley packet filter. So now I guess kernel, kernel folks uh, will tell me that I should just call it BPF, um, which um, it's referred to now in the kernel space. It's an, you can imagine it like a virtual machine running inside the kernel. It sounds crazy and it really is. So you can inject um, custom code, which will be compiled and executed by the Linux kernel at specific um, execution points. So we were talking about OCI hooks before. OCI hooks have similar to compiler stages, um, specific um, uh, execution points where you can uh, run them, for instance, before executing the container uh, or creating or starting or stopping. So you have uh, posts and pre-hooks, for instance, you can Im imagine this or trans translate this to the kernel. Um, most of it, I guess the initial work for BPF has started for packet filtering um, to make networking substantially faster. Um, Basically, it, this allows high performance networking in the or with Linux because packets can be filtered in the kernel and not in user space. And this makes things um, substantially faster. And the idea has somehow evolved over the past, I believe, 15 years or so and um, was improved a couple of years ago, maybe 10 years ago. I, I have I have a book in my shelf, but I'm uh, not not. Uh, <laughs> Not very good in history, at least in in this specific area. Um, it has been uh, evolved um, into covering more than just the network stack. So now there are um, many more places and functionality in BPF that you can use to introspect and mostly profile. So at the moment, most of the things are profiling and for introspection um, this is how most people use it. There's a great, great, great book that I recommend reading from Brenton Gregg. He's a great Linux engineer, and I believe he's also working at Netflix. And they use BPF a lot, not only for performance analyses, but also for, for security and monitoring a lot, because you really get uh, real-time data from the kernel. Um, which is good for, for system administrators to see the performance of the cluster or to detect unhealthy nodes, to detect potential attacks, uh, intrusion detection, um, or if some processes just got rogue or sick, um, all these kinds of things you, you can do. And how this is basically how we implemented the OCI second book too. We used BPF and for each return, so for each return from kernel to user space, um, we were, or, or the, I, I believe the other way around, every time uh, um, syscall is executed this way around, basically 
This is how you change from user space to kernel space. We look at the syscall um, that is being executed and recorded then uh, with the hook. So you have user space programs which can then communicate um, with the buffers of the BPF program that is currently being executed. So it's very, very powerful. I can uh, and could only cover now uh, the very small area of BPF that I know of because it's just such a vast um, area now and so quickly developing at the moment. I guess the most, most exciting feature for BPF, uh, especially for HPC folks, could be that up until now, it required root privileges, but now there have been added, I guess now there's two new capabilities in the kernel. So if you have these capabilities as a process or as a user, you can uh, run and execute BPF programs as a non-root user, which I find pretty exciting. Okay, and so and so you and coming back to OCI hooks now, like the OCI hook then will introduce this eBPF filter for the kernel that is about to start, and when the EC the OCI hook like the container stops, then the post hook can remove the eBPF filter or or program from from the from the container execution. That's what you that's how it works. Then am I right? Uh, that's that's right. So uh, when the container exits um, the profile, the second profile will be generated based on the list of or set of syscalls that we recorded, and then it will exit and uh, clean up. Cool. And Lucas, do you have already a new kernel like OCI hook in mind that you will implement with this? No, not yet. <laughs> not yet, but <laughs> it sounds very interesting. I, uh, I, will, I will look into it afterwards, of course, because it sounds really interesting. Um, I'll I mean, post a link to the book in the channel. Okay, perfect. Okay. I'm any, not being paid by him. Is that, <laughs> is that any final thoughts on OCI hooks? Maybe then, uh, if not, then we can move on to um, runtimes in general. I, I put it on the introduction slides, and I was wondering whether we should talk about C run and run C maybe next time more. There is this new, and I, I learned about this like in preparation for the workshop that there is a C run runtime. Um, anyone wants to like elaborate a little bit on this? Or are there other runtimes like C run and run C that we should mention or that we that we miss here? Well, it was it was quickly mentioned during the, uh, I think during one of the slides during the Saros presentation. It's uh, that uh, it uh, you can use each of those runtimes uh, interchangeably. I mean, you can you can use either run C or or C run without uh, without any problems. It's, again, you know, it's a matter of standards. You know, and and keeping the interfaces as long as that happens, you are good to go. And it, and this is one of those cases where uh, things not only look good on PowerPoint, but they actually work in practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. So, but so we have and so like Saros uses run C at the moment or can use C run interchangeably because it's, as you said, transparent choice, right? The other runtimes we talked about today, they don't use run C in the back, right? Podman uses, doesn't use run C, right? Or do Podman, you? Uses, Podman uses both. Um, as Lucas mentioned, um, they can be used interchangeably. Um, CRAN, CRAN comes, comes from a colleague um, from Giuseppe Scrivano, who is also working in the Container Runtimes team uh, at Red Hat. And it started, I, I guess he was bored over Christmas holidays, or he couldn't move anymore because he ate too much. Um, it, it started as a proof of concept. He, he, he loves writing C, and I guess he missed the coding in it after working on Go. Um, and he wanted to have a look at the performance impacts of how much we can tweak on how much performance we can uh, gain when implementing run C or uh, OCI runtime spec compatible container runtime written in C. And this is how C run, C run came to be. And now Podman uses it by default on Fedora, 
because <clears throat> sorry because fedora now the default c groups version of the fedora kernels is version 2 and run c at the time now it doesn't fully support it and um, because run c is somehow the de facto standard OCI runtime. It was the first one and is implementing the runtime spec, um, but it moves a little bit slow, um, especially when it comes to adding new features and implementing new things. You have a chicken and egg problem because commonly uh, to get something into a specification, you need to prove that something is working. And in order to prove that something is working reliably, you need to somehow prove that it's working on a larger scale. And Serum is really, really nice for that. And so Giuseppe implemented supports for Cgroups v2. And this is why Portman at the moment defaults Portman and Builder and, um, and also uh, not, not yet Cryo um, because Kubernetes is not yet uh, supporting Cgroups v2, but Portman and Builder are, are using that. It also allows for experimenting with a couple of other things. For instance, recently we spoke about uh, um, OCI hook support in CRUN, it also supports them for sure because it's part of the specification. But one thing we noticed, and uh, I believe uh, Lucas will, will agree to that, that debugging OCI hooks can be really hard because it's hard to get to the logs, you need to stand it out, stand it error. And Giuseppe recently added also yet another set of annotations to specify where standard error and standard out of the OCI hook shall be written to. So it can be any file descriptor or file, um, which really allows for an easier, easier debugging. So CRUN has uh, another set of features which are not yet part of the OCI, but it's basically our playground in the community to experiment with new things, prove that it is working, and then get it into, into the OCI, and then run C can follow, which is um, pretty much what, is, uh, what has happened now with C groups v2. Yeah, and Eduardo mentioned like C groups v2 for repo, you even mentioned it, but um, can someone like maybe Valentin, but someone else as well, if you want to chime in, um, like give us a gist of C group V2 and what is different to V1 and why it's so amazing. I can, I can cover, cover it briefly, but I'm, I'm not a specialist in C groups. So um, there were a couple of design decisions that made uh, C groups um, not always easy to use they were hard and not always usable for rootless uh, containers. Cgroups v2 supports now um, that rootless containers or rootless user can uh, have full control over the cgroups. Um, so cgroups are commonly used. Um, they're short for control groups to limit the resources of a container. For instance, you can um, limit the amount of memory a container or processes within the C group can consume. You can further, it's a hierarchical concept. So if C group A can use 30% of the CPU or of memory, the subgroups can further divide these 30% of the total CPU usage. So it's a very, very powerful concept and also needed, especially um, in Kubernetes or in multi-tenant Kubernetes um, clusters um, or environments. And uh, Cgroups v2 um, cleaned up many of the sins of the past and made it usable for um, rootless containers. Um, I believe Akihiro Suda, um, a brilliant engineer, wrote a very great article about Cgroups v2 last year. I will look it up and paste it in the chat um, because I believe everything I know about Cgroups v2 comes from Akihiro and Giuseppe, and I'm pretty sure they will uh, explain it much better than I can ever do. We all stand on the shoulder of giants. Yeah, we do. <laughs> okay. Um, so C groups V2 will help. And then there's also a FOSDEM talk, I think, uh, about C groups V2. I think that's that's where I get all I know about C groups V2. 
I guess this first time talk was by Akihiro and Giuseppe. Yes. <laughs> see, see. All right. What else? We've still like, let's say, 10 minutes or so left. Then we will have a bio pause and um, I will put on the jazz vibes again. And then um, we will start at the top of the hour. Any, any other thought about runtimes? I mean, do we, are we going to talk about runtimes next year like as extensively as we talk about them today? I guess yes, right, to be honest. I hope so. No, Greg and Andrew, you guys here disagree. I hope we talk about the special features that we see over the next year, right? There's a lot of innovation that's happening right now. So that's where I hope the focus to be. I prefer, I prefer, I prefer if the, I, sorry to interrupt. I prefer if the, if the conversations kind of move past runtimes at this point. Um, I mean, me personally, I mean, been doing this for like four years now talking about the runtimes. Uh, I think that there's a lot more problems on the HPC front that need to be addressed. Uh, that's more so than just the runtime. So that's my take on it. Or maybe we can talk about how the non-HPC folks ad adopt our runtimes. Let's see. Or vice All versa. Right. <laughs> Or vice versa, yeah. All right, cool. Any other questions in the chat? Give it a couple of minutes. Oh, or like 10 seconds because we have five seconds lag, I think. So Slack channel, light up if you have any passing questions. Otherwise, we will stop for a 15 minutes bio break. And we can continue on Slack, of course, because I cannot stop Slack. So still, Shane is typing. OK, let's wait for Shane to. Finish, but I think that will conclude the runtime segment. And as I said, we will like start in 10, 15 minutes. Um, I will put on the nice music. So thanks for the panelists. And uh, yeah, see you guys in 10, 15 minutes. <laughs>